Since 1934, Iowa's farmers have turned to the Iowa Farm Bureau spokesman as their trusted news source. Now, the spokesman speaks. Listen in and hear from leading experts on topics important to farmers and agriculture. Now, here's your host. Welcome to our February 21st edition of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. I'm Andrew Wheeler, and today's episode features Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Mike Nag, who joins us to discuss new partnerships that are accelerating Iowa's water quality protection efforts. We also welcome on Jolene Brown, an award-winning speaker, author, and farmer from West Branch, Iowa, to share a bit of her advice on managing the family dynamics in your farm business. Let's start with Secretary Mike Nag to discuss the collaboration that's moving Iowa's water quality forward. New spokesman editor Tom Block will take it from here. Hi, Mike. Thanks for joining us. Uh, The department recently announced a collaboration with several Central Iowa partners to help farmers get more cover crops seeded earlier in the season. Tell us about that project and how that came about. You bet. Well, we're we're really excited about this project in that it it brings together some unique partners. And uh, certainly that includes the Iowa Department of Agriculture, uh, Polk County, and Des Moines Waterworks, along with Heartland Co-op. Uh, to be able to invest in and acquire a high boy, a, a Hagee machine that can seed cover crops into a standing crop and be able to get those seeded earlier in the season because we know that that's so important to getting that good growth that we need in the fall. And of course, this is really an important watershed. It's a targeted watershed important to us. And uh, we're really excited about this partnership and the ability to flat out just get more acres of cover crops on the ground, build on a lot of momentum across the state. And there's some pretty ambitious goals here. I think the project covers four years, but talk about some of the goals you have. Yeah, it does. And we wanted to make sure, really, at the end of the day, this is a unique partnership and, and going and buying that, that piece of equipment is certainly a new approach for us. But we wanted to, at the end of the day, ensure that it amounted to getting cover crop acres uh, on the ground. And so we also know that that can take some time. And, and so we wanted to make sure that when we looked at this, we said, let's give this project a chance to ramp up 40,000 acres of cover crops over the next four years. We actually think this project can do more than that, but that's the baseline and we'll see. I'm really excited. It's a great partnership too, in that we've got Heartland Co-op has been doing some really exciting things with conservation agronomists, folks going out to uh, not only just provide the normal services that they would or the crop advice that they would for farmers, but also then going to the next layer and saying, well, where might a conservation practice be able to be incorporated on the land and then connecting us with those folks. So they're a real innovative partner and and trying to figure out how to incorporate this into their ongoing business model. And, And I say this all the time, we will work, truly work with any partner who in good faith wants to go out and get more work done across the state. Thankfully, we've got several hundred partners who, who are willing to do that. And these are the latest uh, partners that we get to add to that group. And for farmers in those targeted watersheds, there'll be more information coming down the line on how they can get involved and sign up or do they reach out to Heartland? There will be. I mean, there's going to be more information. We just announced the partnership. And so how that plays out and who's calling on farmers, those things will be coming. Uh, but certainly Heartland Co-op is the lead uh, in, in terms of they'll be actually applying the, the cover crops. Hey, we're also considering this a a potential pilot as well. So, uh, you know, always looking to say what works, what could be improved, and how do we do more of this? Again, we're just trying to go to the next level. Over 2 million acres of cover crops in the state of Iowa. We need several more uh, million acres of cover crops, and uh, we can do that. But we're going to have to continue to address these barriers that exist of, hey, how do we get those acres seeded in, in a timely fashion in the fall? Do we have enough quality seed out there? You know, those are some of those challenges that we absolutely begin to run into when we get to these higher rates of adoption. Now, another project the department announced last spring was working with partners and contracts to streamline the process of installing bioreactors and saturated buffers on farms in central Iowa. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an update on the progress of those projects? Again, a a great innovative approach. Not that the practice, well, the practices actually are new, but saturated buffers and bioreactors are things that actually practices that have been developed since the original nutrient reduction strategy was launched in 2013. So again, an example of how 
we're always innovating. We're always trying to figure out what practices uh, can make sense. And in this case, we've been wrestling with, a lot of folks have been trying to think about this. How do you knit these together? How do you batch together practices like bioreactors and saturated buffers to get them designed and then hire one contractor to build those out? Been trying to wrestle with this one for uh, for several years. And finally, we got the partners in place to do it. And so I love to share credit, right? I want to I want to make sure that all of our conservation partners know that uh, we don't try to take credit alone for these things. And so we got to give credit where credit's due and and certainly Polk County and and the Department of Agriculture together with the Soil and Water Conservation District in in Polk County and some other partners working together to identify the landowners who are interested, design the practices all together and hire one contractor. And Polk County served as the, uh, the financial agent, the fiscal agent, if you will, to make that happen. I'm forgetting one key partner, USDA. We appreciate their support as well. And this is an example of partnerships that help accelerate the momentum of efforts geared at improving water quality. There's a lot of good data out there measuring progress. What do you see on the ground as you travel the state and visit with farmers about the excitement around conservation practices? So we we built around 50 practices as part of that first uh, batch. And, and what we then turned around immediately to do is to find the next 100 or 150 you know, practices that could go in in the same landscape. So, so there's one example of even phase two of that batch and build process will accelerate. And we're taking that model and working with, uh, we, we can't make announcements just yet, but we're close. Um, there will be additional projects in, in other parts of the state with similar groupings of, of partners that we'll be very anxious to be announcing. What I see across the state is uh, absolutely I can say uh, without a doubt that we have never had more awareness, more resources being uh, applied to conservation practices in the state of Iowa, more interest and more participation in partners and landowners and cities. And that is a special thing to be able to say. Now, here's the next thing I'm going to say about that. And we're not where we need to be just yet, right? That's good progress. We're, we're headed in the right direction. We're seeing more work being done, more practices on the ground, but we know that there's a lot more work to do. And so again, the call remains, uh, the call goes out as it has before, which is we need more partners to work with us. We need farmers and landowners and, and cities to be looking for ways to incorporate conservation into their uh, operations and into the landscape. And the other thing that we'll always fight for here at the Iowa Department of Ag is we recognize that not all practices are created equal, not all landscapes are created equal, that from north to south and and river to river in the state of Iowa, there's a lot of diversity in our landscape. What we want to see is a culture of conservation that allows people to implement practices that make sense for them, and we're not forcing them to accept or, or adopt certain practices. So that's how we'll see lasting change but we're seeing a lot of acceleration out there in terms of adopting practices. Yeah, that's actually what I was going to touch on next, Mike, is the approaches that work in different parts of the state are different. You've got right. you know, people think Iowa's flat and pretty uh, monotonous or, you know, even, but that's typically not the case. That's not the case. And we have so many different uh, distinct land formations and soil types. And, and again, operations are different. You know, whether you have livestock or not matters in this, right? Uh, do you have cattle? Do you have, do you have hogs? Do you, all those dynamics are, are different. Are, are, you, are you flat land in north central Iowa or are you rolling hills or, or do you see a more dramatic landscape, uh, you know, along, uh, along the borders? Uh, you know, we, we need to make sure that we're also doing those traditional tried and true practices that have worked. Things like terraces and waterways and buffer strips and no-till and and, and then again, layering in these, these other practices that work at the edge of the field, like wetlands and bioreactors and saturated buffers. Again, there's a whole suite of practices out there. And uh, those things are, are interesting to different people in different ways. And, and, and here's the other thing. So we think about where we go with the next level, right? And we're hearing a lot about climate smart ag and, and carbon sequestration, right? What's the nexus between carbon and climate smart ag and soil health and soil erosion prevention and water quality. Those things all work together. And again, that's an exciting, I think, future too, to figure out how to bring all of that to bear. And we have some very innovative farmers out there. And I think the best way a lot of farmers learn is that farmer to farmer sharing. Absolutely. There is no better uh, source of information 
than a neighbor or another farmer. And I love to tell the story about one of the first field days that I went to around cover crops. The a farmer got up in front and and said, uh, we tried cover crops uh, and uh, and it failed. And I thought, oh my gosh, what's happening? What's happening here? I, who let this guy up here? And then he proceeded to talk about all the things that they had done and learned and they'd made changes. And and at the end, he says, you know, don't don't repeat my mistakes. Go make your own mistakes, but at least know from my experience, this is what what worked and didn't work for us. And and I found that to be incredibly valuable. People are shaking their heads and and I thought got a lot out of that. And, and that's really important to have a very real farmer to farmer exchange of, hey, this is how this has worked. It's not easy. Here's what we did. And uh, th that can be incredibly valuable. So we're big believers in locally led, farmer focused projects with, with a lot of field days and opportunities for interaction. Uh, that's a great way for folks to learn. We're glad to have Secretary Nag back on the podcast. It's pretty incredible to hear him say that Iowa has never had more awareness, resources, participation, and collaboration to improve water quality than we have right now. But when you look at everything that's being done to protect water quality in this state, you'd have to agree that it's definitely unprecedented. And much of the credit for that progress goes to folks like those of you listening to this podcast. We know that water quality progress starts with leadership and action on the farm and in communities all around this state. So thank you for the difference that you're making. Next up is Jolene Brown. Jolene was a featured speaker at Iowa Farm Bureau's annual meeting back in December. And during her presentation, she talked about how farmers can best manage the family dynamics in their farm businesses. Spokesman reporter Corey Munson caught up with Jolene afterwards to ask her more about it. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Obviously, making plans for the family business for the farm and how to transition those between generations is a big part of what you talk to folks about. So what's your background? Where did you come from? And kind of how did you get into this line of work? Well, I am a real farmer brown from eastern Iowa. And I grew up on a farm that was very diversified, but my father's love was Belgian draft horses. So I really grew up showing those gentle giants and hitching them. Then I married a real farmer brown and had a chance to expand my agriculture production skills because we had both livestock and we had grain. But the real reason that I'm doing what I do is I see tremendous pain in agriculture. There is so much opportunity for those of us to learn our production skills our weeds, seeds, breeds, feeds, money, machinery, and marketing. But it's the people that do all the production. And in the deep dark of the night, it's not how many acres you have or what color your equipment is or how many animals you have that keeps you up. It is usually something with the people. And so I'm addressing the human side of agriculture when I do my work. Now, during your presentation, you kind of gave an overview of some specifics about the process that you encourage folks to undertake. Mm -hmm. Uh, when looking at these issues, when really establishing the business side of the family business. Can you kind of give us an overview of that? Well, there's two areas that we are trying to address. First, there has to be a business worthy of transitioning. And then second, we do the transition to another generation. And who said it had to be to family members? especially when it comes to cousins level and beyond. I have a lot of cousins who really don't want to work for one of their cousins, but they each have their specialty and they're each good at what they do. Well, who's going to help lead that? And so they might need an advisory council or an outside leader to help them do that. And I also have lots of businesses where daughters-in-law are leading the business. And one of the reasons they're so good is they're scared to death of doing something wrong. So they do everything exactly right and they keep the people on board. So the process has to start with understanding that silence is the great killer of both family and business. That if we don't share where we're at today, and today what we would plan to do, knowing those things can change, but if something happens today, this is what would happen. We have to hold up that mirror to reality. And then we go from there, what would we rather have happen? <laughs> and that's where we talk about the what ifs, or if we did this, or we had this advisor giving us options of what we could do, it would be helpful. They understand for me that a conversation is not a contract. Everything that has to do with building a good business and with transitioning, it has to be documented. Because if it's not in writing, it does not exist. 
I have had some of the, sometimes the only thing I can do is hold their heart because they've had those conversations. This is the expectations and surely it's how it's going to be. But if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. And what was interesting is I talked to four people today who I, my guess is in their 50s, 60s, or 70s. They don't have wills. And I said, the state of Iowa has a will for you. You're going to wish you had your own. <laughs> and they said, really? And I said, yes. And so here's what you need to do. So one of the women said, I can't get my husband to get a will. And I said, do you have a will? She said, no, I can't get him to go. I said, here's what you do. You look at your calendar. You have nothing on January 21st. You call your attorney. You make an appointment for your will. Put it boldly on the calendar. And then you're going to start digging through the files, how things are titled, what you own, what you owe, who are beneficiaries, what you're going to have to transition, what you want for executor. And your husband's going to say to you, what the heck are you doing? And you say, I'm going to attorney John on this date to write my will. I said, he'll be there. He's going to want to know what you're going to do. So again, it documents the fact that things must be in writing. So kind of at a high level, again, why would you say this is important? Why, why should folks have these plans in place? I would imagine there's a lot of opportunity for conflict when you're having these discussions. There's potentially family stuff that's going to come up. So why do you, want, why do you think it's important for folks to have these tough family discussions? If you don't do things when the times are good, you can count on problems when the times get tough. So I am all about you build the business worthy of transitioning. So as you look at the overhead, some of the things that they need to do. They need to understand what their business is today. They have to understand, do they really want this to continue? And I want a yes or a no. I don't want a we'll see or we're not sure. Or I want to know, is this the fire in your belly that you want this business to continue? And then I want to know when you're going to transition the leadership and ownership. Well, we'll transition management and, la and labor, especially when it comes to the late nights and the technology. Okay, you do that. But I want to know when you're going to transition leadership and ownership. Is it during your lifetime where you're training people or they're training you and you see the fire in their belly, you're vetting them? Is that who you're going to transition? Uh, is it going to be during your lifetime or is it going to be at the reading of the will? Surprise. And that's, that causes more breakup than anything else. I think we need to understand that there's things you do when the times are good. Do you want the business to continue? I've got to find that out from the asset owners. And the second thing is, when are they going to transition it? And then to whom? Who's going to have, is it all family members? Is it key employees? Is it the marketplace? Just tell me the rules of the game. Then I can decide, next generation can decide whether or not they want to play it or what they need to do to earn the right to be a part of that game. You mentioned earlier that silence is a real killer mm -hmm. in this process. So I would imagine you don't want to be surprised when that will gets read. Well, hopefully we have set up structures such as operations in an LLC and maybe land in its own entity, an S Corp or an LLC or partnership or something. And those then transition. I want 100% of operations to be owned by those who know how to operate the business. I don't want to have people from the outside telling me, and I'm a minority one, but I'm doing all the work and I understand the business, but I report to them. So I want you to work really hard in your estate plan and when you come into the business, how do we get 100% of ownership assured transition to them when it comes to operations? Then land is its own entity. And if you do split land amongst people, some of them will be owners and some active owners and some not perhaps, they have to understand their governances. They can't micromanage them, but they should expect reports. And above all, they expect a return on their investment. People need to be paid two ways. If you're an owner of assets, you get an ROI, a return on your investment. And your accountant helps you set that. So yes, I, the farmer, can't keep buying stuff so I don't have any money to pay them, nor can they expect 20% return. I had a, a sister say that to me. I want a 20% return. I got this due this year. And I said, how's your CD working for you? So it is your accountant that will help you set the return on investment. I want operations separate from that. And when we do that, whenever you form a structure that what's an LLC, an FLP, C or S Corp, partnership, whatever, whenever you develop a structure where there's jointly held assets, the same day you go in to sign that legal document, if you don't sign a separate document called the buy-sell agreement, they've done you a disservice and my phone's going to ring. You never create an entity without a way to dissolve it or how to transition the parts of that entity. And that is extremely important in a buy-sell agreement because one of the things is, what are the terms? Is it cash on demand? Well, it might be for death or disability or a three-year buyout. But if it's divorce or debt or disillusionment, I don't want to work here anymore. I have a fellow who married, who's been married now for three years, but the person he married can't stand the smell of chickens and they're in the poultry industry. 
So he wants to take everything that's in his name, give me cash now, we're gonna move. Well, according to the buy-sell, it's a 10-year buyout for disillusionment. And here's the interest rate. Yes, you can go, and yes, you will get your money. Here's how it's appraised. Here's who's gonna buy it. Here's the interest rate to do it. And that's how you can continue the business and assure it can continue. I want a buy-sell agreement that trumps a will because wills are changed on a whim. You'd be shocked to know the number of people who have the expectation of what the will says. Then at the reading of the will, it may go to the church or 4-H or to somebody who they've just married or to the nurse who, who took care of them in the hospital. They'll change their will at the drop of a hat. As long as they're of sound mind, they can do that. The buy-sell agreement for these structures trumps a will. It's a contract. And a contract made while you are living stays in existence for its term after you're deceased. So the terms of the buy-sell stay in effect. In your experience, then, what are some of the biggest stumbling blocks to establishing uh, these businesses or, you know, for accomplishing mm -hmm. this as a family? Stumbling blocks are many. Worry. Oh, my gosh, I don't know what we're going to do in fear. Ignorance. Stupidity is as fun. We know what we should do, but by golly, we're too busy to do it. Arrogance, oh, so we'll take care of that later. We don't have to do it now. We know we're too important doing our production stuff. We don't have time for the people stuff. Those are all stumbling blocks. And the big one is fair and equal. When you have some of your next generation active in the business, especially operations, and they're really the ones who are now managing and leading it, and you're kind of wiggling around and moving on, the, on your journey. What I find is you may have some in the business and you may have other children not in the business. So what do we do for our estate? And I shared today about an apple pie. I want you to picture that we have a beautiful apple pie and it's going to taste so good, it's going to smell so good. So I'm going to invite all of my, quote, heirs, all of my next generation, and I'm going to take out an old time protractor because I have to divide it in equal angles for the number of people. So if I have four kids there, everybody's going to get one fourth of the pie. That is equal. Here's fair. I have that same apple pie. It's going to smell so good and taste good, and I can hardly wait to share it. And then I step back, and I think about the apples that went into the pie. And then I step back farther, and I think about, gosh, who planted those trees? Who kept them watered? Who kept them nourished? Who kept the insects and the disease away? So that years down the road, that little apple tree could grow and bloom and then produce some beautiful apples. And then I step back. Who picked those apples? Who stored those apples? Who marketed those apples so I could go to the store and buy the apples and make a pie? And now I bring the same four of you to the table. And I say, if you notice, the pieces of the pie are not the same size, but neither has been the investment into the making of the pie. Had these two not been active in operations, they know how to run the business, they know stuff I didn't know, I would have been long gone, I couldn't keep up. Had those two not do things so well, I couldn't come and go as I wanted to go. And, and, and had they not been here, the legacy of this farm that means so much to all of us could be in the wrong hands. So if you notice, the pieces of operation don't include you. What they are inheriting, by the way, comes with a great deal of risk to keep that going. Now, over here, we have a different set that comes with less risk, and they're tied together. So operations has the first option to rent from you. And if you want to be bought out and get done with it, here's the terms of how you can get bought out so that a business can still continue and we tie it together. Then we're talking fair. The pieces of the pie are not the same size, but neither has been the investment of the making of the pie. Well, thank you so much, and that is a lot of information, and you presented a lot of amazing information today. So going forward, if uh, listeners want to learn more about this process, mm -hmm. uh, maybe follow up with you or get one of uh, your exciting books that you have available, uh, how do folks reach out to you? Pretty easy, joleenbrown.com, J-O-L-E-N-E brown.com. And what you're going to find is I have a DVD set a three-hour workshop, which comes with a workbook that lets them honor the family by doing it right. And then, of course, the, sometimes it takes more than a two-by-four is a book. And that's because when I consult, I bring a mirror, a box of tissues, a roll of duct tape, and a two-by-four. And those are all the tools we need to make sure we make progress in the transition. Then the last book I wrote was Holy Crap, I Married a Farmer. It's a tribute to my sisters in agriculture, the lessons we learn to laugh together, to cheer each other on, and to hold each other up. And those are all available at JoleneBrown.com. We appreciate that insight, Jolene. I think that most farmers would point to family involvement as one of the big advantages of a career like farming, but we know that it also comes along with its share of challenges, especially if there's not strong communication amongst the various participants. So it's helpful to get some advice on how we can keep those business conversations open with family members. 
That's all for this episode of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and that you'll join us for our next one on March 7th. Between now and then, remember to get registered for Iowa Farm Bureau's Acres of Opportunity Conference. It's a day-long conference that's going to give you the chance to learn from seasoned farmers and other experts about some unique niche crop and livestock opportunities, from farmers' markets and vegetable production to hops and meat goats. That conference is March 12th in Cedar Rapids, and we're encouraging folks to get registered by March 4th. The event is free for Farm Bureau members, so be sure to head over to iowafarmbureau.com today and get registered. Thank you for doing the work that inspires everything we do here at the Iowa Farm Bureau, and thanks for listening to The Spokesman Speaks. Thank you for listening to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast by Iowa Farm Bureau. Check out more podcast episodes at iowafarmbureau.com slash podcast. You can also find and subscribe to The Spokesman Speaks podcast in the Apple Podcasts app, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and other popular podcast apps. We appreciate your ratings and reviews, and we welcome you to email us your feedback at podcast at ifbf.org.